G'day guys, welcome back to the True Footy YouTube channel. If you are new to the channel, uh, first of all, welcome. We've had a lot of people subscribe in the last week or so, so I just wanna say thank you. Uh, and what we're doing today is working through this 18 team series I'm doing at the moment, where I'm working through all the clubs and going through their New Year's resolutions ahead of 2024. All of this is available in a playlist on this channel if you wanna go find that. There's also a playlist for projecting every team's best 22 in three years. There is another playlist for analyzing each team's best 22 for 2024, so a lot of preview content coming out of the channel at the moment. So today, like I said, we're gonna do the Fremantle Football Club and uh, this one feels like an important year for Fremantle to really try and improve after you know jumping out of the blocks in 2022 and then really stagnating hard in 2023. As an Eagles fan, I feel like I'm actually somewhat bullish on what Fremantle can do this year and beyond compared to the average neutral fan. Maybe it's because I have a lot of Dockers supporting friends. Maybe because, you know, I used to live in WA, so I used to watch them more so than any other club other than West Coast, probably. But I do feel like there is a there is a lot of potential on this list. They just need to get a few things right in 2024 to, to really deliver on that potential. So that is what we're going to go through in today's video. I've got eight resolutions that if they improve these, it will ultimately lead to a better outcome. Before we crack into the video, if there is anyone that is watching the content and enjoying it on this channel, it would be a lot to me if you hit subscribe and try to grow this channel uh, as much as possible ahead of the 2024 season and 26,000 subscribers by round one is my new goal. So if you're enjoying the content, it would really help me out. All right, let's crack into these resolutions. And uh, the first one I'm going to put is consistency of performance. Now this one might seem like a throwaway one because in theory, absolutely every club in the league could say that they could have performed more consistently in 2023. But when you look at Fremantle, I think they embody inconsistency of performance almost more so than any other club in the league. And I'll give you specifics as to why. So at the start of the year, uh, they lose to St Kilda, but in the second round of the year, lose to North Melbourne at home. Admittedly, North were playing well at that point of the season, uh, but nonetheless, it was a big shock. that They also had a 50-point loss to the Bulldogs. And when you consider the Bulldogs didn't play finals last year, nor did Richmond, who they also lost to in Perth, those are some really bad losses. But on the flip side, they beat Sydney in Sydney, and then they also beat the D's away, whilst also losing to Sydney in a big way in Perth. Further to that, they beat the Cats twice, and I know the Cats didn't play finals in 2023 and had a you know a bad year. They still beat them at GMHBA, which is probably one of the hardest football trips in the game you know, perennially, not just in 2023. So what we're seeing here is a huge divergence between what Fremantle are on their bad days and what Fremantle are on their good days. And I think the fact that they are winning uh, those tough games against good opposition, particularly on the road, is an enormously good sign. We're just seeing a huge gap for some reason. And that will be one thing that Fremantle need to iron out, getting the bridge of the gap between their best and their worst. And Hopefully for them, it'll be improving their worst, not um, getting their best to drop down a level. The second resolution is around replacing the best 22 players that they lost this season in Lockie Schulz and Liam Henry. So first of all, uh, you know, replacing Lockie Schulz will be tough when you consider he kicked 33 goals this year, which I think put him equal second in Fremantle's goal kicking tally. And avenues to goal you know, for a while has been a little bit of a shortcoming for Fremantle. So that will be a serious one that they have to consider. And when you also consider Walters was weak, equal second with 33 and he's not getting any younger, finding some sort of internal replacement for Schulz who can hit the scoreboard will be an important focus. So one option is Jack Delane who they just took at pick 60 in this year's draft. Now, again, he's 18 and was a late draft pick. So you don't want to put too many expectations on one kid. Having said that though, he is a bit of a goal machine. Uh, he kicked 43 goals this season at different levels for South Adelaide. He kicked 28 goals last year as a bottom major, and as a 16 year old, he kicked 35 goals in the 13 games he played in the under 18 side. So as much as he might have some deficiencies, I think around potentially like speed and endurance, what you do get from Jack Delane is someone from who can hit the scoreboard. So I've said it previously in a video, but I could see Delane playing a little bit earlier than people expect. So that's, that's one internal option. Um, if they're gonna look externally, uh, probably uh, in terms of list management stuff, there's a couple of players, both of them at North Melbourne actually, that I expect Fremantle to have some interest in in the off season. Obviously, I've talked about what they can do right now, uh, but in terms of the off season, Cam Zerha is going to be a restricted free agent. I think he would make sense as the target for Fremantle. And there's also Robert Hansen, who's over there, and uh, he's a Subiaco product for the mid-season draft that is out of contact at the end of 2024, and Fremantle might just knock on his door. But either way, what I'm saying is that they need to find a replacement for Lockie Shaws as a small to medium type. As I said as well, Liam Henry as a genuine wingman, they're gonna to have to try and find a way to 
fill that spot in the team. And I've got a few uh, nominations. So w- one of them is uh, Jeremy Sharp, who they picked up as a uh, delisted free agent or a supplemental pick. I can't remember. But he was at the Gold Coast Suns and obviously, well, he didn't even play a game in 2023. So it's going to be a speculative one, but he does have the attributes to play that role. Then there's Nathan O'Driscoll, who played 10 games this year, couldn't really lock down a spot full time. But nonetheless, a decent internal option that they could give some opportunity to. Another one is Heath Chapman, who um, is a bit of a gun, and I actually want to talk about him a little bit later. But he's one option as a taller sort of intercept defender that could move up the ground and has the attributes to play that wing role. So I think they're probably better placed to replace the wing spot than they are the forward spot. Uh, But either way, that's going to be a focus in terms of optimizing their best 22. The next point is around getting more goals from a second key forward. So again, uh, this is rehashing the the small forward and avenues to goal issue. That being said, they probably still need support from their second key forward in terms of goals on the board. So we know Jai has had a breakout year, 41 goals from 22 games. That's absolutely ridiculous. And uh, he, he looks like a terrific young talent. Uh, that being said, uh, Josh Tracy sort of emerged as maybe their next best key forward uh, to pair up with Amos, and I think he's gone past Tabiner. That being said, he only kicked the 15 goals from 17 games. Now, I do realize that he is only 21 years old, and uh, he looks like a decent prospect. That being said, that will be a huge focus if Fremantle is looking to really push back into finals this year, which I imagine they are. So getting more goals from either Tracy or someone else is, is a must, I would say. Uh, and Luke Jackson, again, as well, he played... Uh, well, the whole year in kick 22 goals. I actually think that's a good return. So more support around them. If we can get a more balanced contribution between three talls, aside from the smalls for a minute, I think that's something that Fremantle also need to do. Fourth resolution I have is have a successful transition of Hayden Young into the midfield full time. So uh, while I say that, I do think, you know, if he fails as a midfielder and just goes back to being a gun halfback, I think that's a fine result. That being said, it's obviously a bit of a focus for, for Fremantle this year. And what he does add as a big bodied sort of defensively minded but also attackingly gifted if that's a phrase sort of midfielder that does add something different to what Fremantle have there so I did note in the last five games of the year he played he attended 74% of Fremantle's center bounces so that is that is showing a clear intention to get him into the midfield so I suppose generally speaking their resolution is to have Hayden Young play as a midfielder and succeed there long term for Fremantle the next point is fairly short and sweet, and it's just about retention. Please just don't lose any more best 22 players for your own sake. So we know that they lost Schulz and Henry. I just talked about that. That was after losing five players in 2022. The year before that, it was Chera and Hogan. Uh, I won't go through them all, but there was 15 trade requests in six years, and I've, I've done a whole video on Fremantle's retention issues. So all I'm saying is just don't add to that this year. <laughs> The next one is about uh, potentially trading in a big fish. And specifically, it's rumored that they've got their eye on Logan McDonald. And honestly, you'd be crazy as Fremantle to not have your eye on Logan McDonald, who is out of contract, uh, like I've talked about a lot on various different videos. I think he's one of the best young key forward prospects in the league. And like I sort of touched on, sure, Josh Tracy seems to be projecting okay. And as a long-term backup, he'd be fine. But imagine pairing Logan McDonald with Jai Amos. And this would be a fantastic opportunity this year specifically to go for Logan McDonald. He will be out of contract, not as a free agent, but they are armed with three first round draft picks and uh, in a great position to make that happen. So I think that would be top of mind for them as we get into the latter parts of the season. The next resolution I have is uh, referenced this player already, but Heath Chapman, and it's just about keeping him fit. And again, I know this is a little bit out of the control, but it's still a resolution anyway. He only played the three games this year before injury, but I think he does project as a pretty quality AFL player. He played the 17 games in 2022, I think, uh, for 19 disposals and six marks a game. He uses the ball really well, and I think he does have that versatility to be kind of like a lockdown, undersized key back almost, but like a running defender as well, and potentially a wingman, like I suggest. So... I don't really know what his best role is at AFL level. I suppose that will all play out. But he does use the ball really well. Like I said, he went on Rising Star nomination in round 8 of 2022, I think. Because he had 25 disposals and went at 92% efficiency. So those are pretty ludicrous numbers for a guy who, if, if he was playing key back. So I think potentially utilizing him up the ground is a good move. So long story short, get him fit and showcase what he can do at AFL level. And finally, we'll end with a simplistic one for Fremantle, and that is just to get back into the top eight. Now, we saw Fremantle drop from 15 wins in 2022 to just the 10 in 2023, which was an entire nine spots lower on the ladder. I do realize there are extenuating circumstances. I know that the football isn't always just about analyzing how many wins and losses you get in a given year. 
It's a little bit different to the Premier League in that sense. That being said, it is still a disappointing result and you could probably point to the loss of experience in one hit that Fremantle, Fremantle had, potentially got worked out tactically as well after an out-of-the-box season. Sean Darcy also spent a bit of time out of the side that hurt early on. Uh, that being said, this has been a long rebuild uh, and it has been occurring since you know 2016 in a sense with just the one finals appearance. So while they do have the fourth youngest list and second least experienced list in the AFL, the, the players that they are going to take them to the next level have been in the side for a while, you know, your Brayshaws, your Sarongs, uh, and therefore I think Fremantle can expect uh, realistically to at least be close to the top eight and, and realistically have that expectation in 2024. And I, I realize that opposition fans don't seem to rate Fremantle that much, judging by what people are saying, you know, in terms of the, you know, the YouTube content that I'm consuming, the predictions around Fremantle are very negative. I, I think they should be striving to get back into the eight. And if they fall just narrowly short, I'd still say that's kind of a productive season, if that makes sense. But overall, guys, those are my thoughts on Fremantle. I think they should be trying to get back to relevance um, soon. And uh, obviously, I've given a little bit of a blueprint of a few ways that I think they can get there. More goals in the front half, whether they do that internally this year or find a way to um, supplement what they have through the trade period and drafting it, etc. There's reason for optimism, but at the same time, it has been a lengthy time um, outside of Premiership contention for Fremantle. So uh, it'd be interesting to see what Fremantle fans reckon in the comments below. Let me know what you thought of my analysis, anything you'd add, anything you disagree with. But overall, I appreciate you watching the video. I appreciate you being subscribed and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers, guys.